Hi everyone, this is Rachel Sandberg, and in this video, we're going to dive into privacy law and text data mining research. And I apologize in advance, but there's some construction noise in the background that even with headphones, I can't get rid of. So when we think of privacy law and text data mining, we often think about cleaning our data so as not to reveal personal information about individuals. But what personal information is actually protected by privacy law? And what are we allowed to publish? And specifically, how do privacy law challenges come up in the context of TDM? In other words, what do we mean when we say privacy in text data mining? In the United States, and unlike with copyright law, which is basically just a matter of federal statutes, there are actually multiple sources of privacy law. First, there's the constitutional right of privacy, which protects personal privacy against unlawful government invasion. Note that the Constitution does not explicitly include the right to privacy, but the Supreme Court has found that it implicitly grants a right to privacy against governmental intrusion, and it does this through the First, Third, Fourth, and Fifth Amendments. These constitutional rights to privacy, however, are typically not what we're dealing with in the context of humanities text data mining. If you, a researcher or TDM professional, are doing the work, you're not a governmental actor, so you're not likely violating someone's constitutional right to privacy with the research you're doing. You may be violating their privacy rights, but not those privacy rights arising under the Constitution. Second, there are also federal statutes, laws made by the U.S. Congress, that provide protections for certain types of information or certain types of individuals, and there are a bunch of them. Federal privacy statutes include those like the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, known as FERPA, the Financial Services Modernization Act, which is Graham Leach Bliley, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which you know as HIPAA, the Privacy Act, the Right to Financial Privacy Act, the Stored Communications Act, and more. Don't worry, this video is not going to cover the ins and outs of all these federal statutes because the reality is that any research you do, text data mining or not, that involves the kind of information at issue under any of those statutes is going to require institutional review board approval because it invokes the private information under federal laws. These statutes impose obligations on how such data should be collected, managed, and disclosed or not. The only unique aspect of text data mining when it comes to dealing with this kind of federally protected information is that in text data mining, you're potentially creating privacy problems that are exacerbated by the volume of data you might be collecting. If you publish a data set for transparency purposes to test your algorithm, and that data set contains covered information from thousands of individuals, you could have a violation of these statutes at much greater scale than with other types of research. This is where robust research data management plans covering the data for the entire research life cycle of, of your studies are critical. Instead, what we want to focus on is a third source of privacy law, the one most likely to have particular relevance to humanities text data mining research because of the sources of information you may be using. And that is the general privacy laws created by states. These can either be creatures of state statutes or what is considered common law, that is law derived from court opinions, apart from any statutes that might exist. These statutes and common law or court opinions create what is called tort causes of action, resulting from unlawful invasions of privacy. Now this is tort with an E on the end of the word. While this tort looks delicious, that's not what we mean by privacy actions that create tort relief or privacy torts. Our torts have no E on the end, and they essentially are a wrongful act or infringement of a right other than under contract, leading to civil legal liability. So it's basically a civil as opposed to criminal wrong that you could do to someone and it's something you do that's an infringement of some non-contract based right that either statutes or common law have created. For instance, if you have trespassed on someone's property, you may have committed a tort. If you have interfered with their livelihood, you may have committed a tort. If you have defamed someone and caused them harm, you may have committed a tort. Again, these are civil wrongs that infringe various personal rights that people hold. In the context of privacy, there are typically four torts we need to be aware of as text data mining researchers. Now, the existence and recognition of these privacy torts varies by state, making these waters very murky for cross-border research. There were 
There will always be questions of which state's law applies and in turn, which privacy torts are at issue. Typically, tort issues are determined by the local law of the state which has the most significant relationship to the occurrence of the invasion and the parties. But generally speaking anyway, these are the four privacy torts that most states recognize in some form or another, whether through statute or common law rights. Although recognition of these four harms goes back much further, the torts were articulated by William Prosser in his California Law Review article titled Privacy in 1960, and they include intrusion upon seclusion or solitude or into private affairs, public disclosure of embarrassing private facts, painting someone at in a false light in the public eye, and appropriation of name or likeness. As set forth in the Legal Encyclopedia American Jurisprudence, quote, the rationale behind recognizing these four torts is that courts have a unique and essential role in protecting the individual's private life and space from well-intentioned but ultimately oppressive, insulting, degrading, and demeaning intrusions. And the right to privacy is an integral part of our humanity. One has a public persona, exposed and active, and a private persona, guarded and preserved, and the heart of our liberty is choosing which parts of our lives will become public and which parts we hold close, end quote. To understand these Prosser torts, it's also important to know that the right protected by a tort action for invasion of privacy is a personal right, specific to the individual whose privacy is invaded. In the absence of a state statute providing otherwise, the cause of action is not assignable and it cannot be maintained by other persons, such as members of an individual's family. This is why, as we'll see, a person's death typically extinguishes their right to privacy, at least under state prosser torts. We may feel bad ethically about disclosing the private affairs of deceased people, but the deceased people do not bear a privacy right in that information anymore under state statutes. So let's talk about what these four torts protect. First, both intrusion upon seclusion and public disclosure of embarrassing private facts require the invasion of something secret, secluded, or private. For there to be a tort on these grounds, a person must have had an objectively reasonable expectation of seclusion or solitude in the particular invaded place or as to the particular topic or matter intruded upon. In order for a defendant to be considered to have intruded into a place conversation, or matter as to which the plaintiff had a reasonable expectation of privacy, the defendant must have penetrated some zone of physical or sensory privacy or obtained unwanted access to data by electronic or other covert means in violation of the law or social norms. A defendant is not liable for the invasion of privacy under the theory of intrusion upon seclusion if a plaintiff is already in public view at the the time of the alleged invasion. This setup reveals that community standards are often important for gauging privacy invasions. Intrusion into private matters is not binary. There are nuances to societal recognition of expectations of privacy. By the same token, the fact that the privacy one expects in a given setting is not complete or absolute does not render that person's expectations unreasonable as a matter of law. Now, for public disclosure of embarrassing private facts, it's important to note that the law does not recognize a right of privacy in connection with further publication or amplification of information that is already public or known to many people or a matter of public record or otherwise open to the public eye. For a fact to be considered private, someone must demonstrate an actual expectation that the disclosed fact remain private and that society would recognize this expectation of privacy as reasonable and be willing to respect it. So again, we see that community standards are important for gauging whether a privacy violation has occurred under these first two Prosser torts. So let's turn to painting someone in a false light. This privacy tort is similar to the tort of defamation, but there are different standards of proof. You've painted someone in a false light if you've published the information widely, not just to a single person, as in defamation. The publication identifies the plaintiff, there is an element of fiction or falsity to the information you've published. That falsity would be highly offensive to a reasonable person, and you are at fault in publishing the information. Now, appropriation of name or likeness protects a person's exclusive use of their identity. The phrase name or likeness embraces the concept of a person's character. The tort does not protect one's name per se, but rather the value associated with that name, and typically only when done for commercial gain. 
So we're instead talking about appropriating name or likeness to try to obtain for yourself the reputation, prestige, social or com commercial standing, public interest, or other value of the plaintiff's name or likeness. You're unlikely to do any of this in nonprofit research. So we can begin to see that mostly the two torts you're going to be concerned about and the type of text data mining research you're doing are the first two Prosser torts, intrusion upon seclusion and public disclosure of embarrassing private facts, assuming you're not willfully painting someone in a false light. So the question now becomes, now that we know what we do about the common privacy torts that can arise in text data mining research, how can we actually navigate these when making research choices? We'll explore this in the next video.